Okay, we ready for one more? I don't know what I did wrong to be put right before lunch, but uh, here I am. Ah, good point, good point, yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, thanks for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. I have been uh, a student of Lou Kreisberg's, a virtual student of Lou's work and many of your work for um, a long time and have studied intractable conflict myself for about 20 years. Um, and although today I have to admit that I'm, I've been studying that less and turned my attention more to sustainably peaceful societies because I think that we understand peace mostly in the context of war and violence and peacemaking and peace building. And we don't really understand the dynamics of sustainably peaceful societies and it's critical to understand that and not just understand the mitigation of violence. But with that said, um, Lou contacted me and said, you know, we were having this conference and possibly a book and can you talk about your complexity stuff? So, uh, um, so we, we uh, took this, Josh Fisher is my co-author and we took this as an opportunity to try to move our thinking forward a bit. So I'll, um, I'm going to stay pretty um, meta, pretty global, big picture theoretical. No data in this presentation, although there's some data behind a lot of what we've done. Um, but I really just I, uh, want to argue for the power of ideas uh, that influence the kind of data we want to collect. Um, and uh, so that's my case. Um, what I'm going to argue, and this is something I've been saying for a long time and was reiterated today a little bit, is that the scholarship in this area is nuanced and rich. It's a complex area, as it should be. Um, and yet it offers us a kind of disparate set of understandings of why conflicts become intractable. Um, as I said in one book, uh, identified what I said were 56 essences that scholars said it's really about trauma or it's really about identity or it's really about, you know. Um, so I've been uh, struggling with that challenge for years. Um, and it really is a challenge not only for us, but obviously for policymakers that have to make decisions um, and how does the, our science inform those, those decisions when the field is as fragmented as it is. And one of the reasons I, I believe that the scholarship is as fragmented is because of our approach to science. Our, our, our classic approach to science for 400 years has been atomistic. We try to break things apart, look as deeply, carefully as we can, systematically at something and understand how that affects something else. And then we, um, after a while, say that that's a factor or a parameter, um, and yet the world is, doesn't operate like that. So linear science has uh, moved us forward considerably, but has also limited us in terms of the applicability of our knowledge. Um, and we've been missing, I think, in this domain, a coherent theoretical model that connects the dots. We know a lot about the pieces of what happens in different idiosyncratic, intractable situations, um, but we don't understand the sort of core dynamics that capture it. So what we've been doing for probably, I don't know, 15 years now have, has been applying complexity science ideas, particularly out of something called dynamical systems theory, to understand how these conflicts, all different elements of these conflicts from the physical to the psychological to the social to the group to the international, et cetera, how different factors align and evolve in time to create these kinds of systems that resist change, that resist rational choices and decisions around change. Um, and uh, mostly we focused on this notion of attractor dynamics, which I'll talk briefly about. I'm gonna basically talk about two abstract con concepts from applied mathematics. One is attractor dynamics and what those are, um, which is what we've done most of our research on in about 15 years. And then I'm gonna talk about fractals um, and how we think that the attractor dynamics that we've been studying have what we, they call in mathematics a fractal nature, which means that you see these dynamics, very similar dynamics, not identical but similar, in people's physiology, psychology, social dynamics, normative group dynamics, intergroup dynamics, and societal dynamics. You can see very similar kinds of dynamics happening. Um, and so that this might be one way that we can start to bring some kind of coherence or parsimony to our understanding of why these societies and these problems become intractable. 
so yeah, this is this area of dynamical systems that I've worked in. I've worked uh, with a team, um, Robin Valiker, Andrzej Novak, Lan Bruy Ryszynska, Larry Leibovich, Catherine Kugler, and Andrea Bartley. It's a multidisciplinary team. Andrea is an anthropologist and a peacemaker, many of you know. Uh, Robin Valiker and Andrzej Novak are complexity scientists. Andrzej was more um, trained in complexity science and applied mathematics. Larry Leibovich is an astrophysicist. Um, so uh, we're an eclectic group. I'm a psychologist, social psychologist pri primarily. Uh, and we've been working together, published these two books. The 5% is a more trade book that talks about the application of these ideas. The Attracted to Conflict book is the science and the modeling behind the work that I talk about in the 5% that came out actually a couple of years later. Um, and basically what we're arguing in this is that it's useful to understand conflict social, as a social process that is a pattern that forms from the interaction of a lot of different elements and settles into patterns over time. That that is a useful kind of heuristic to think about these things. Oh, wow, I don't know what I just did there, but let me try that. All right, very good. Oh. <laughs> um, and so in these systems, so a dynamical system is simply when you have a bunch of different elements, even in psychologically, you're, you have attitudes and feelings and behaviors and different things, and as those things affect one another, over time, they settle into certain patterns, right? And that's a dynamical system, is how these things affect one another, a, a complex system, how these different things affect each other, over time to settle into certain patterns that sometimes resist change, sometimes are more open to change. Um, so these systems can stabilize, um, and they can not be affected by intervention, uh, attempts at constructive change or even violent change in the ways that we think. They become sort of unpredictable, right, because of their complexity. Okay, so again, what I'm summarizing now is sort of 15 years of research that are in these books and other articles. But basically what we argue is that intractable conflicts, and this is one, uh, network of interrelations of different kinds of variables, many of them you study, um, but that these conflicts are not necessarily about the things, the elements, the conditions, the identities, the trauma experiences, but they're about how different elements affect each other and become sort of tightly linked so that a change in any one or two or three of them has either no impact or has unpredictable effects because they're a network of, a systemic network that's evolving in time. So they become tightly coupled, and in the terms of, of complex systems, they what they call self-organize. And this is an important idea, because what self-organization means is that, say, a group starts to have very strong intrinsic processes. So the idea of sacred values or cultures of honor or cults are groups where you have very strong intrinsic dynamics where the members of those groups police each other and sanction each other and be must believe the same thing and espouse the same rhetoric. And so they start to what we call self-organize because the internal dynamics are such that external attempts to influence them seem to have no effect, right? So it's this particular kind of dynamic, a self-organizing dynamic, that makes them much less uh, um, influenced by either external intervention or even sometimes normative constraints that had previously existed but that the, 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 the group starts to not adhere to. So they take on a life of their own. And one of the things that's interesting about this that we discovered in mostly interview processes is that in these settings that become, as we, as we know, more and more pervasive, more and more complex, more parties can become involved, more issues, the issues change and evolve. Um, they spread and become more complicated or complex, but the experience of them, that kind of complexity is overwhelming to us. We, it's hard to make sense. So we simplify. We oversimplify into us and them, or we simplify in our science because the overwhelming complexity of this is such that we feel completely out of control, and so as human beings, our tendency is to simplify. And that basic dynamic is something I want to emphasize and talk about, is as these conflicts spread and grow and become more pervasive and threatening and overwhelming and exhausting, 
there is a strong tendency for us to psychologically, socially, and culturally um, uh, become coherent, become more ordered, become more simplistic in our understanding of dynamics, in our response to dynamics, et cetera. But that's a core dynamic that I want to emphasize. In other words, people's subjective experience of these conflicts tends to overwhelm some of the objective information or changes that take place. So in time, we're, oftentimes if we're in these disputes, we're less responsive to changes in information and in the environment because the internal dynamics of it are so strong. Okay, you with me so far? 10 minutes, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Complexity in 10 minutes. Okay, so <laughs> in mathematics they call these kinds of patterns, these self-organizing patterns, uh, attractor dynamics. And you see one in nature up there, you see one in da data there, um, which they define as a state or pattern of changes towards which any kind of system evolves over time and to which it returns if perturbed, right? Um, basically, what mathematicians find is if you measure something, so you measure in a marriage, positivity and negativity between two, two partners, right? And you measure that over an hour in the, as they're having a dispute. And you can start to plot, well, you know, A and B are here and A and B are there. And you can start to plot the dynamics of their emotional experiences in this conflictual encounter. And what you find is if you do a lot of those, that most marriages have very coherent attractor patterns when they're in conflict. So if you bring that same couple back a week later, a month later, they're falling into the same kinds of patterns. Those are strong attractor patterns. There's, it might be different conflicts, different times but they, for a variety of reasons, evidence this, right? And they can see this kind of data in a lot of kinds of analyses over time, but you have to collect data over time to see these kinds of patterns where the system, no matter what happens, there might even be a crisis in the family, but they kind of come back to the same space, right? Um, this is similar to the notion of what we call dynamic equilibrium. So there is an equilibrium, but it's an equilibrium that's caused by the sort of changes that are taking place, in, taking place in the internal system where your patterns of thought and feeling and action become very coherent um, and sort of settle into a pattern that attracts. Okay, so attractors as an idea, as a mathematical idea, have four kind of components. One is valence, so some attractors in a society, let me talk about Columbia because I just came from there. Some attractors, in, so my experience of being in Columbia is that there are two very strong attractors there. There's a very strong attractor for violence. And that violence is multi-dimensional, so you have paramilitary, history of paramilitary violence, you have rebel violence, you have drug trade, which is an extremely violent component. You have a, a, a lot of patterns of violence that are very ensconced in this culture. And you also have Decades and de decades of attempts at peace building and peacemaking and negotiation. So you have a strong attractor for attempts to resolve and work things out, a more kind of positive interdependent attractor, and you have another one that really is about kind of resorting to, problem, to violence as problem solving, right, by the government, by the rebels, by paramilitaries. Um, and so those attractor patterns have a valence, some of them are more Experiences more positive, some more negative for the system, some are in a more neutral space. Um, they have different strengths of resistance to change, so some of these patterns are very amenable to change, and so you can see change happen rapidly. But intractable conflicts create these very strong conflicts, these dynamics that are resistant to change. They have what we call a, a wide basin of attraction, which means that even things that, be, this is why they become more pervasive, even things that seem particularly irrelevant, like which cafe should I go to tonight, somehow start to take on meaning that's relevant to the conflict. So more and more of life gets sucked into these patterns of thinking and feeling and acting, uh, these attractors. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, and then uh, manifest or latent. So one of the important things to realize is in Colombia, for example, Currently, there is a tentative attractor dynamic around peace, right? It's tentative until October 2nd when they, when they will vote on this process and then we'll see what happens. So it's in some ways at a tipping point between two different attractors. Um, 
they're, they're both present simultaneously, but when you have active conflict or active war, destructive violence, um, that's where the, what's capturing the dynamics of the system. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a strong potential for a radically different kind of dynamic to exist. Um, and so part of what you need to understand is what are the conditions where you can sort of deconstruct the violent tendencies of a system and bolster and strengthen the more cooperative, harmonious tendencies of that system, right? But oftentimes in any kind of social system, they will both exist. In intractability, there's a strong tendency for the negativity and a less of a tendency for the positivity. Okay, so this is just a visualization of an attractor dynamic, which just shows that kind of, you can start at two different places in the system, um, but over time, the pattern will evolve to a fixed point. So the dynamics out of the system and eventually uh, evolves into the next dimension. Uh, here's an attractor cartoon, which again shows two tendencies. The dot is sort of today the current state, and that the longer that that current state holds, the stronger that attractor tends to be. Um, but over time, these things change slowly. And the importance of this is that these patterns, of course, are historic, long-term, um, uh, and multiply determined. So the, the patterns themselves take a very long time to change. Violence or nonviolence or peace or conflict can actually change radically quickly overnight. There's a peace agreement in Mozambique after 16 years of a bloody civil war. How the hell did that happen? And it's fairly rapid and very, fairly quick. But the patterns and the potentials that exist in that system take a long time to change and establish themselves, okay? And it's really the idea, the difference to some degree between kind of peace building and peace making. And peace building is really about understanding how to deal with these probabilities and change the probabilities in the system. Okay. All right, so some sense of what attractor dynamics are? Yeah, okay. If not, buy and read my books. Um, <laughs> fractals probably heard about this construct. It's again a sort of a phenomenon in mathematics. These are simply phenomenon in nature or in mathematics that um, have three qualities I'll talk about quickly. But basically you sort of see the same kind of either structures or dynamics at different levels of analysis, right? So um, they have what they call self-similarity, Scaling relationships in a fractal dimension. Now, I, and I, I don't want to bore you too much before lunch on this, but what it suggests, and this is how we're beginning to think about attractive <coughs> dynamics and attractability, is that the, the particular dynamics that I'm talking about uh, in intractability can be evident in fairly similar ways across levels of analysis. Whether you're studying the neurology of citizens that are living through protracted conflict or the cognitive processing of those folks, or the emotional dynamics of those folks, or the intergroup patterns that you see, or the structural institutions that start to organize, or the cultural belief systems that start to evolve, you start to see very similar kinds of patterns across those levels. And that's what, in terms of fractals, they call self-similarity. This is not exact similarity, it's what they call quasi-self-similarity, which means that sort of roughly similar kinds of dynamics they scale, which is an important idea. So fractals have what they call scaling relationships. So let me show you just an image of a fractal. So this is a mathematically generated fractal. And so what you can see is the further you drill down, the more you see the same kind of complexity at this level that you see here. And similarly, you drill down here, you see the same kind of complexity. And that goes almost infinitely, infinitely in a fractal. So at different levels, you have very similar either structures or dynamics, right? And so you might think, okay, so the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, let's think about that. So we talk about it in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But that you start to look at, well, the Palestinian communities and the multiple divisions within there, or the Israeli communities and the multiple divisions within there. And the deeper and deeper you go, oh my goodness, the deeper and deeper you go, the more complexity reveals itself and so you start to realize that we, you know, it really, it's, it might be the similar dynamics, but the information is such that it's highly complex, 
And so we can't say, ultimately, we can solve this by focusing on identity at this level of, the, of the, a, a community because every level you go to has the same high level of complexity, right? So that's what they call self-similarity across dimensions. Um, and, and let me just point out that the value of these things is that you can use the idea of attractors and fractals either uh, descriptively, which is how we're using them now as kind of a metaphor to think about what might be happening in these settings. And that's typically how most of the research applying fractals to conflict dynamics have, have used it. Eventually, you can start to use this idea diagnostically to sort of go in and assess the intractability of a particular conflict dynamic by really starting to measure some of these fractal dimensions and how many dimensions show the fractal pattern. And that starts to give you some sense of the robustness of this particular conflict dynamic in that setting. So you can start to basically relatively diagnose the intractability of different aspects. And then eventually you start to understand some degree of causality, which we're a long way from even imagining. OK, showed you that. These are examples in the paper. We actually did write a paper, so we have a paper if you're interested. <laughs> Finished it last night, as a matter of fact. Um, these are examples in the literature of people that use the construct of fractals quantitatively. So they use the, the, uh, the quantitative uh, approach to uh, the fra fractals to look at psychosocial and physiological levels of analysis and conflict, um, to look at interpersonal conflict through laboratory experimental work, to model some of international relations and civil wars and show that they show some kind of fractal qualities. Um, and then this is used metaphorically to understand sort of identity formation at different levels in Northern Ireland. So this is a, an idea out of applied mathematics that can be applied both as a metaphor to think about why these things get stuck, as well as to start to use in a quantitative way, um, which offers all kinds of power and utility. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, this is just an example from, the, uh, from a database that looks at uh, global deaths since 1400 in wars. And it, what it shows is that fractals can be both, again, structures that you see, but they also can be, in times, patterns that keep repeating themselves over time. So this is an illustration of three, pa uh, fractal, uh, uh, three patterns that are fractal self-similar in nature that you start to see over time when you get big pieces of uh, big uh, databases that uh, go over long periods of time. Uh, okay, so this is what I want to argue with the, uh, the a sort of basic dynamic that can start to explain um, intractability at multiple different levels, right? And it's something I mentioned earlier, which is that over time, what tends to happen is that you have increasing press or pressure that comes into the system from perceived threats, from actual harm and loss of loved ones and friends, from the increasing complexity and confusion that comes from that, from rapid rates of change that may take place during certain periods, or just periods of, of great instability. And that kind of press we see over and over again having an effect on us psychologically, neurologically, psychologically, socially, culturally, et cetera, of bringing our sense of coherence, our understanding, our identification of ourselves and the other into this more kind of coherent, constrained, certain. So the rise of religion is oftentimes around certainty in your beliefs of what is true, right? Rigidity, group sanctioning, and ultimately closed processing that you become less interested in changes in the environment and new information coming in, and more about, but you become more focused on defending the system, what we call it autonomous process. And this is the basic dynamic that we, in the paper, um, um, show that there are a lot of areas of research through cognition, emotion, identity, and behavior at the individual level which is what I'm most familiar with because I'm a psychologist, but at the group level, intergroup dynamics, intragroup, intergroup and cultural dynamics, and then even at the kind of structural level of societies and regions where you see essentially 
this same pattern, right? So there are a lot of different variables that many of us and others study that they associate with more intractable conflicts. Some of them are social, psychological, some social psychological, more sociological, cultural, um, structural variables. Um, but many of them evidence the same kind of dynamic across levels. And this ultimately is the notion of fractal. I'm probably out of time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes or no. Um, so basically what we're arguing is that I think the field would benefit from, to some degree, uh, changing our language and our assumptions about how these things operate, um, looking to mathematics, applied mathematics, and, and, and data collection as one way to think about these things differently, but ultimately to realize that many of the things that we study um, may be very different kinds of things, you know, sort of neurology, neuro, your neural networks, and structures and societies are obviously very different things studied by different people in different ways, and typically we don't reach e each other's literatures, but they share common dynamics. There are similar dynamics that we can see across these levels that are these essential attractor dynamics, and understanding that starts to lend some parsimony, some clarity, to our ability to work with this, and it suggests that whatever level we're working at may look very differently even though the dynamics are the same, right? So that has all kinds of implications for policy and intervention and practice, um, but that's essentially what we're arguing that. Yes. Okay. I think I'll leave it there. Yes, thank you. <laughs>